uh, for coming. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here in my new hometown. It's not that new anymore to me, but uh, it's, it's great to be here, and I really appreciate it. Uh, so I'm not really sure what you think you're going to hear tonight, but I'm going to tell you <laughs> what you're going to hear, and then you're going to hear it. So, and the reason I'm saying that is because you may not hear from me what you had hoped to hear. So keep it in your brain. Uh, I'm going to leave as much time as possible for questions and discussion. Um, uh, but it, it's it, because of the constraints of COVID, uh, it won't be the ordinary, usual kind of interchange. Uh, I have to kind of stay in one place because there's a camera, but I'm not going to play to the camera. Uh, but I, I can't move around and we can't have that kind of discussion because when you ans ask a question, I'll have to repeat the question for the microphone. <laughs> so it's a little weird. It's not the strangest talk I've ever given. It's, 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 a, it's a little bit strange, but not as strange as the one I gave in Istanbul in 2010. That was very strange. I was asked to Istanbul to do a very serious erudite scholarly presentation at the university and I had a few other engagements there and a young man came up to me and he said what are you doing Thursday night and I said well I did nothing or didn't have plans and my wife Lita who many of you know was with me and he said well I belong to a group of young married couples and we're meeting and we'd like you to give us a talk I said okay I'm happy to do that I'm not going to charge you anything for it. I'm happy to do it. So where is the talk? It's at the Supper Club. Now, the Supper Club is a bar. It's, there's, it's the second of two Supper Clubs that started in Amsterdam. It's a little unusual. My talk was to be about sex. And uh, I thought, okay, I could do that. Young married couple. And, and they said to me, Lita, wear a short skirt. So I figured they didn't say that to me, but they said that to her. I figured, okay, this is going to be strange. And I, we go into the club, and it's and and the talk is from 7 p.m. to dawn, to to daylight, to sunrise. It's right under the big bridge that goes across the Bosphorus to Asia. And instead of chairs arrayed on the floor or even in an amphitheater, it's beds. There are beds with you know pillows and. and sheets and everything and there's and i said and i'm going to need some water and by water i mean vodka which is all they had to drink and these people were really you know just knocking it back and i had an opening act which was a very tall black gentleman completely bald in a very nice emerald dress singing torch songs in a deep baritone voice that was my starting act and then a follow spot and another so I gave him a talk about sex, and uh, it went very well. But that was really the most unusual talk I ever got. I went back to the university and suggested they do the same thing. They, they wouldn't have it, do you? Anyway, so listen, wellness. And I was very thrilled when Cindy approached me and, and asked me to do this. The whole overall topic of the entire series will be wellness. And of course, wellness has so many definitions, and everybody has a different definition, personal definition for wellness. So what I won't be talking about tonight, won't surprise you, is I'm not going to be talking about what would be called physical wellness. I'm not going to be talking about physical health and physical medicine. That's part of wellness, for sure, but that won't be. Uh, and uh, I'm only going to be talking about emotional wellness of people who are neurologically fit. In other words, I won't be talking about mental illness except very tangentially, and I won't even be talking about wellness programs for people who are in therapy or counseling. Because I, I'm, I don't know everyone personally, but I think that would be a better uh, aim for, for the group. We're, we're pretty good, we're okay, but we all need wellness. So just, just to let you know, but if you have questions, specific questions about that, save them for later, and there's time, I'm glad to answer them. What I'm going to do is introduce a lot of concepts to you. They will be different and on purpose, because I want you to hear things that you've never heard before, and I don't know what you've heard, so I had to really reach for these things, and I will 
do that. There's a lot of concepts. I promise you it's going to sound as though I'm going off on a tangent. I will come back. And hopefully it will make sense when all is said and done. What I'll suggest will be just that, a suggestion for how you can approach your own emotional wellness. This is not the final word. This is not written in stone or blood. Uh, it's a few ideas, and I've developed them over the years in my laboratory and in my clinical practice and in my human life. I'm also going to talk a little bit about what I call the wisdom of the aged, with a D and not an S. You know, if you want to know what wellness is, talk to an old person. An old person who feels well. And say, what's wellness to you? Talk even to a dying person. And say, listen, are you happy? And say, no, I'm not happy. Of course I'm not happy. I'm dying. I say, no, no, I, I, no, I'm not happy that you're dying. And don't get me wrong. I don't mean to be insensitive. But are you happy with the life you've had? Did you live a good life? Are, are you content that you made good use of your time? And so many say yes. I say, tell me the secret. What should I know now? What is your definition? So I'm going to tell you what they tell me. And I think that's very wise. And I'll get to that also. I'm going to give some definitions. The topic is coming of age, the wellness of learning. So I'm going to define coming of age. I'll define wellness, and I'll define learning in ways that maybe you haven't heard before. I'll tell you a little bit about what the brain tells us about learning and how important it is to our survival and how important the concept of truth is to our survival. It's central. And then I'll list three challenges to our wellness that are familiar to everybody. Anxiety, depression, and loneliness. So, coming of age. I like that better than the word aging. Well, for a couple of reasons. The most obvious is, when you say aging, it doesn't sound good. No one likes that word, aging. Unless you're an old cheese, or a wine, or a piece of leather furniture, where aging is good. Most of the time, it's pejorative, it's lousy, no one wants to be aging. And yet, of course, it's obvious that we're all aging every single day from the moment we're born. We're aging, we're getting older, we're not as young as we were the day before. So aging not only is pejorative, but it's meaningless. Why use that term? I like coming of age better, but even that's got problems. We use coming of age usually for young people. We almost never apply the term to older folks, or anyone else, for that matter, or, or people younger than the people for whom we use it. Usually we use it to imply that the people are of an age, chronological age, number of years, when they're able to do something that they couldn't do before they were that age. They can drive, they can go to war, they can marry, they can vote, they can go to war. I know I mentioned that, but I'd like to emphasize that. It has nothing to do with whether or not they're capable of doing any of those things well or properly. It doesn't imply any capacity. It's simply an age. So I don't really like that term for that reason. But I still like the idea that coming of age means that you are now able to do something you couldn't do before, and it's because you're older. But that can apply to anyone at any age and at every age. So my message is, we should all be coming of age all the time. Every single day, we can be coming of age by gaining skills and knowledge and capabilities and capacities that allow us to do things that we couldn't do before, either because we didn't know about it, we didn't have the learning, and there's that word, or maybe we didn't have the brain development. Let's take a, a young child who thinks in concrete terms. 
If you say to someone, listen, I think you're putting all your eggs in one basket. The kid's going to say to you, what does this have to do with baskets and eggs? I thought we were talking to my friends and going to school. and You're talking about eggs and baskets. No, no, I'm not talking about eggs, real eggs and baskets. It's, a, it's an abstract term you explain to this five-year-old. And they go, yeah, sure. So they haven't come of age. Neurologically, developmentally, you can't expect abstract thought. And that's something they don't have much control over. It happens in a normal brain, and it will happen in everybody's. And that happens so many times. What a lot of people don't realize is that most of us remember the teenagers live in a three-dimensional world, and most adults live in a four-dimensional world, where time is the fourth dimension. Adults, every one of the adults in this room has a concept that we're not just living in time in space. We're living in time. We know what to expect. We know there's a past, and we know there's a future. If you don't have that fourth dimension of thought, it makes your behavior look weird to everybody else. So coming of age is something we should do and could do every day. Wellness, well. You know, if you go to someone and say, are you well? They say, yeah, I'm well. What do you mean? They say, well, what does it mean to be well? I don't know. I'm happy. I'm healthy. I'm fine. I'm good. And, OK. Happy and healthy. Maybe they're an axe murderer, and they're happy in that occupation. So we don't really know. We can't assume we know anything. So I'm going to suggest a better word to describe it, and that's safety. Safety is wellness. If we're safe, we're well. Are we going to be able to put food on the table? Yeah, don't worry. We, we're safe. We have, we're going to have food. Are we going to be secure from enemies, foreign and domestic? Yes, don't worry. We're safe. Are we going to be able to pay the mortgage? Yeah, don't worry. We're safe. All right, is our family going to love us? Yes, don't worry. We're OK. We're safe. We don't have to worry. Safety. If we're safe, we're well. And I don't think it's that complicated. And I, don't, I can't think of a, a contradictory situation to that. So safety is going to come up more and more in, in this conversation. And learning. Learning will come up also. I'll get into these three things in greater detail. So what is learning? Well, it's not really that hard to figure out. We all have beliefs. We develop these beliefs over the course of our years. Doesn't matter how old we are, we all have a certain system of beliefs. The thing is, we aren't really aware of the majority of our beliefs. We're not conscious of them. They're just in there. We've come to believe them, and we act upon them. We act upon them as though the belief is true. Should I stop the car or keep going? Well, I see the light is red. I believe it's red, so I'm going to stop the car, and I'm, I'll be safe. I count on my beliefs to be accurate. I count on my beliefs to be true. I need them to be true for my survival. What if we learn something tomorrow that is incontrovertible, is true, that contradicts our belief? It goes against what we may have always believed without even knowing we've always believed it. What are we to do? There's only one thing. Change your mind. Say, oh, yesterday I believed that. Now I learned this. I've come of age because today I can do something that's safer than I could do yesterday because I have more information about it. I have learned. Changing your mind. Such a simple concept. Not as easy to do, but easy to know what to do to accept the truth. So what do 
the aged people tell us. If you say, listen, tell me, what's the secret? And you don't have to go to Tibet, you know, those cartoons and Punch magazine and the New Yorker is always climbing a hill and somewhere in Tibet and there's an old guy, it's usually a man with a beard. And What is the secret of life? It doesn't matter, you can stay right here in Niagara and all. we've got plenty of old folks here who can answer the question just as well. And they say, listen, first thing, this is the people who say, I'm not happy that I'm going to die soon. I'm not happy about that, but I'm content. I don't know one lives forever and I've had a good life. And I'm content with how I've used my time. They say the first thing is don't spend a lot of time accumulating fame and fortune. Trust me, at the end of your life, it will have very little meaning to you. Better yet, decide for yourself. Consult with yourself as to how much is enough. And when you get to enough, stop, because you have enough. If you have enough but want more, that's greedy, and you won't be happy, because there'll never be enough, and you won't have wellness. So decide what is enough. Now, there is truth to the belief, some truth to the belief, that a certain amount of monetary wealth can bring a certain amount of safety. No one would argue that. The wealthy can put food on the table and can pay the mortgage and can go on trips if they want. But in terms of their safety to their well-being, their existential safety, money can buy a bit of wellness. But it can't buy happiness, and we all know that. And we all know of the legions of famous people in the world who have been utterly despondent and suicidal and successful in their suicides, and we wonder, but they had everything. Clearly, they didn't. That's what the aged will tell us. Don't waste your time on fame and fortune. You want to know what it is? Remember, who knows Nature Boy, the song made so famous by Nat King Cole. Everybody sang Nature Boy. I'm not going to sing it for you because I like you and it wouldn't be healthy. And you wouldn't go away well after that. Although I did get to sing it with a, a jazz giant in Cuba once because he invited me up to the stage and I got to sing it. Nature Boy, there was a boy, a very strange, enchanted boy. A little shy and sad of eyes, but very wise was, was he. Uh, we got to talk of many things, of fools and kings. And this he said to me, the greatest thing you'll ever learn is just to love and be loved in return. That's what the wisdom of the aged would say. Have love and be loved and love. That's going to be your treasure. That will be your bounty at the end of your life. Work on that. And make a contribution. Figure out what's wrong with the world in your mind. And do something about it. How many times people say, oh, there's too much this, there's not enough justice, there's, not enough, there's too much wealth, there's too much war, there's too much... And they say, to you, what the hell are you doing about it? You do anything about it? Get off your butt and do something about it. You say, well, what can I do? What can you do? You can change the world. That's what you can do. What are you waiting for? Time's wasting. It's not that you'll change the world necessarily, and maybe you won't get a statue in, on Queen Street over here or a parade. It doesn't matter if you tried your best. Make the change you need to change. Do something about it. That's wellness. And don't wait till you're old and decrepit. Now, I tell people in their teens, in their 20s, in any age, now is the then that you're going to wish you knew then what you know now. Now is the then. Don't come to me and say, no one told me. Don't come to me and say, I never thought about it. 
Consider yourself told. That's wellness. Because it doesn't matter how far you get on the journey of making the world better. It's being on the journey. That's the wellness. So, what was wrong with the world for me was mental illness. There was a lot of it in my family, all on my mom's side. My mom was the fifth of five children. And when she was a baby, she didn't make it to one year old. Her mother committed suicide, my maternal grandmother. My mom never knew her mother. She did know her stepmother, who showed up nine months after my maternal grandmother's death and produced five more children for the same husband. Now there were 10. Nine of them were seriously mentally ill. My aunts, my uncles, the people I loved, the people I grew up with, the people I had holidays with and went to their house and swam and walked and had all kinds of fun with, my cousins, I loved them. And they were all nuts, all crazy, all Looney Tunes, every one of them, and I loved them so much. And I figured it's just not fair. Not only do they have to endure the solitude that mental illness delivers to us, the behavior the mental illness generates creates an additional double-fisted solitude because they're shunned and put aside and not loved. That's not fair, I said to myself as a young boy. I'm going to do something about it. It's not a surprise that I did undergraduate work in psychology, took a doctorate in neuroscience, became an educator, a senior consultant to the Council on Drug Abuse, became a clinical psychologist and still am. It's not a... It's not a a mystery how that happened. I needed to do something about it. Have I succeeded? Will there be a parade down Queen Street for me? No, I don't think so. It doesn't matter to me because I tried. Trying is the wellness, not the achieving. Achieving is great if you do it. You get the Nobel Prize, that's terrific. Get your Academy Award, wonderful. But for me, you'd get an Academy Award for trying. That's enough for me, and it's enough for most people. So I went to McGill, and I entered the psychology department, and the psychology department at McGill, some of you may know, some of you may have even been there, it was one of the first departments of psychology in the world that said, look, if you want to study the mind, you have to study the brain. There is no mind outside of the brain. There's no mind-brain problem, duality. There's none of that. The mind is what happens when the brain is working. It's not a product of the brain. It's not as though the, mind produce, the brain produces the mind and the mind's over here and the brain's over here. No. Monism, oneism, only one. The mind is the brain when it's working. That's important. That's hugely important. Because the word mental means mind. Mens, mentis, the Latin scholars here will agree with me. How many Latin scholars by there? There'd be some. Come on. Anyone? I was a Latin scholar. No, I wasn't. No, I wasn't. I invented a word in a translation that got me sent to the principal's office because I would copy from Lorna Schneider, the translation of the day, just before going into class. And I was called upon her and I said, he said, uh, Ron, what's the uh, translation of the day? I said, well, uh, looks like, uh, and I wrote really fast, you know, on my knee in there. Okay, Caesar, uh, Seems to have uh, came to a word I couldn't read. So what does Caesar do, Ron? I said, well, Caesar uh, appears to have uh, perfused the legions to... What did he do to the legions? Well, he uh, seems to have perfused them. 
walked up to the office. Praised was the word I couldn't read. I never gave up on Lorna, though. She's still a very dear friend. And I don't know if you think I'm smart, but Lorna's really smart. Boy. Anyway. Mens, mentis, means mind. Anything mental is of the mind. If it's of the mind, I promise you it's of the brain. Psyche, a little more complicated, Greek. It translates equally to mind and soul. That's a bit different. Because some people think the soul exists, and some people think that it exists it's somehow separate from the brain. But I'll be honest with you, because I have to be, I don't believe that. I believe that the psyche is the mind, and anything psychological is of the mind, it's of the brain. So to get roped in to these arguments, are oh, it's only psychological. I love it. Marijuana, it's only psychologically addictive. It's not physically addictive. If it's psychological, it's physical. If it's of the psyche, it's of the brain. Period. And that raises an important question. Because are we going to now call mental illness an illness of the brain and nothing else? Is there a mental illness that exists in a normally acting brain? Not if you listen to what I just said. And I'm not going to answer that question for you, but I'd like you to think about it. And maybe change your mind. I taught anatomy for many years in two major medical schools, one in Chicago, Northwestern Medical School, and University of British Columbia. We got to uh, cut open cadavers, which we had to do. We were teaching it. When I got to the brain, I found something that some people just don't seem to get. Here it is, folks. Don't be shocked. Hold on to your seats. The brain is not a muscle. It doesn't look like a muscle. It doesn't come from mesodermal tissue. It's different tissue. It looks different. It smells different. It tastes different. So why go to exercise it the way you would exercise a muscle? It won't work the way a muscle responds to exercise. It will respond, but not in the same way. And if you expect it to, you'll be disappointed. Because the brain is not a muscle. You just have to look at it. Like Groucho, Marx should say, not so simple, a four-year-old child could figure that out. Run out and get me a four-year-old child. I can't make any of them. The brain will respond to exercise. It's not going to get bigger. It's not going to get stronger physically like muscles do. But here's the other thing you may not know. The brain is anesthetic. It can't feel itself. I don't know. It's too personal to ask, but... If you've had neurosurgery where people have done surgical removals or insertions and so forth, you're awake much of the time. You're answering questions to the surgeon and surgical staff because you're conscious. You have to be because they need to know what they're doing. But they say, well, what did you feel then? Well, I don't know. My leg moved or I got itchy in my bum or something like that. But did you feel me touching your brain? No. It's... It's without tactile sensation and no susception, which is pain. Here's a question I pose for you. If the brain can't feel itself being touched, can it feel itself learning? That's a very important question. I'm going to suggest to you, no. But that's just a suggestion. I can tell you there's very little data available on it. Some people might even think it's not that important a question. But psychologically, it's a very important question. Because if we do exercise the brain by repeated reps like we do in a gym, you'll get better at that exercise. You'll get better doing crosswords if you do crosswords every day, but you won't do any better at doing jigsaw puzzles. 
So the brain responds. And there's more to it than that. I don't mean to simplify it and just dismiss the, the concept. But here's the thing. You don't feel after a brain workout the way you feel after a muscle workout. You don't feel sore. You don't feel the change. In fact, you may not feel the change for several days or even several weeks. And that's important because if you're doing hard work, like trying to learn a skill or working on a relationship or trying to get a new job or trying to figure out some math problem, you could work on that for days and not feel a bloody thing. You could go to counseling, marital counseling, occupational counseling for weeks, even months sometimes, and end up saying to the counselor, this isn't working, I'm not getting anywhere, I'm not learning anything, and I'm saying, yes, you are. You just don't feel it. The curve goes a different way. It doesn't go up linearly. It goes this way. Ah, got it. It's there. Eureka, the aha moment. But so many people stop their therapy, stop their medication, stop their training, stop their relationship too soon. Just a matter of knowing, just a matter of learning, just a matter of saying, okay, now I can be better at something because I just learned something I didn't know yesterday. I'm coming of age. Anyone can come of age. Everyone should come of age and must come of age. Now I'm going to take you down the road of evolution. Very long road, so we're going to make it quick. We're going to start at the beginning. Well, not really the beginning. We're close to the beginning, and we're going to zoom up to the end. What is the brain's job, really? Most people, not because they don't care, they just don't think about it. I don't know, what's the brain's job? I don't know what it is. Look, to me, it seems that the brain's job is to let us know as accurately as possible where we are, what's going on where we are, and what are my options for doing something about what's going on where we are. I need to know, and I need to know accurately. I need, here comes that word that's under so much of a siege these days internationally, the truth. I need to know. I don't want to guess. My safety, my wellness depends on the truth. Should I go forward? Should I go backward? Should I stay where I am? Fight or flight. We all do it every day. We don't call it that because we don't consider ourselves animals. But we still are. Let's go back to the beginning of animals. All the way back. Join me in my stroll down evolutionary lane and find ourselves in front of an amoeba. Anyone ever see an amoeba? Biology class, look through a little stereoscopic microscope, and you see an amoeba swimming around, swimming around. Well, not really swimming, they're just sort of moving around. They can't swim, they have no arms, they have no legs, they have no brain, they have no anything. They have, well, they have a cell, they're a cell, they have a membrane. That's it. And yet the amoeba, the one-celled animal, has survived all this time. So it must be doing something right. Or maybe just conditions are right. The primordial imperative of life. Anyone want to take a stab at that? What's the most important thing? If you're alive, what's the most important thing? The thing you really have to make sure it continues. Assuming you're not mentally ill. I'm not trying to be funny. Yeah. Survival. I, I want to stay alive. By the way, speaking of truth, I think everybody knows for certain 
that I own a sports jacket, so I don't have to prove it anymore. And it's getting hot in here. There you go. For those of you hoping, that's it. <laughs> Sorry. I know this crowd. I know this novel crowd. They're, they may have white hair, but. All right. So here's this amoeba that's swimming around. And I've said this to graduate students and other people. I say, keep watching. Just watch. You're going to see something amazing. You're going to see something. You say, oh, OK, that's, that's very cool. What happens? Well, what happens? After a little while, what do you see? You, you take a guess, you'll probably be right. Two amoebas, that's right, mitosis. Not my mitosis, mitosis. The cells say, okay, well, that's a pretty good guarantor of survival. Because now there's two of them, and you've got twice the chance of surviving. But it has to stay alive. How does it do it? What does it need? Two things. What's the, the, the first thing it needs? This is not a trick question. What, 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 what do all animals need in order to survive? Food, I think you said that, right? So hard with a mask. <laughs> so hard with a mask. I thought of wearing my Halloween mask. He said, the mask, I didn't know. A mask is a mask. Anyway, yeah. How does it get there? How does it get the food? Luck, just luck. It has no eyes, or ears. It has no arms and legs. It doesn't know if there's food there or not. Bumps into food, it eats. Doesn't bump into food, it perishes. Enough amoebas bump into enough food that they survive. Luck. Chance. What else does it need? It's a little more complicated, but if it's going to survive, it must, or I give it away by saying it must not. A little more than that, Cindy. You're right, of course, but what must not happen to it? Become lunch for something else. Right? And amoebas are good. You know, a little ketchup, they're great for other animals like that. I don't go for them that much. How does it get away from a predator, or for that matter, from a toxic environment, like a poison in, in, its, in its pond? Luck. There's concentration gradients, and, and things that are in there give off molecules, and the amoeba may have receptors. If it has receptors, it's got a sensorium, then it's not an amoeba anymore. Evolution. So knowing there's some food over there, because some of the molecules came and got into my receptor over here, I now have to solve the problem of meeting up with that food. Because these molecules, I don't eat the molecules. They're tiny. They're nothing. How do I get there? I'm going to have to have some locomotory Capacity. I'm going to need some arms, some flagelli, cilia, or just pseudopods that go out like this. I have to get from here to there. If I get from here to there, I eat, I survive for now. If it's not something that sees me as lunch, I have to go down the concentration gradient so fewer of its molecules get to me and I'm going to be safer. Fight or flight? But I need to know which is which. Even the amoeba, or the new animal that has a sensory motor capacity, needs to know what's a word that we use for the need to know. What do we call that when you need to know something? I'm, I'm sorry with the mask, Learning? Sandy. Learning? No, I no, I haven't learned anything. I just need to know something. I haven't, I haven't got that knowledge yet. Hey, I like curiosity. That's the word I need to know. Curiosity. There are volumes, probably libraries, filled with books on curiosity and consciousness and all kinds of stuff. We don't have time to go into that now. A curiosity is the subjective concomitant of the need to know. The need to know the truth. Give me an example of a mental illness. Now, that may be a tricky part of the question. Give me an example of a human condition where a human approaches its killer repeatedly approaches its killer 
Uh, it's so hard. Please just shout it out because... Addiction, good, thank you, excellent. Addiction was the answer for those of you watching. <laughs> Both of you will, <laughs> we don't know, there could be thousands, they could be all over the world, we don't know. Who knows? An alien comes down to Earth and his job is to see what humans do and he says, well, he reports back, sir, I found out what they eat. They eat, you're not gonna believe this, he says, they eat by rolling up dried out leaves in paper and they light it and they inhale the fumes and that's how they eat. You idiot, that's, that's not eating, that's, that's smoking, that's smoking, it's gonna kill them. Oh no, they didn't act like it was gonna kill them, they went right for it. They put down money on it. They had a supply. Something wrong with that brain. I would call that a mental illness. It's serious to approach the thing that will kill you. Give me an example of a human condition, and I'll give you a hint, it's a mental illness, where the individual withdraws from the nutrients that would cause her to live. Yeah. The same alien would say, well, I know certainly what's poison because she went away, and if she accidentally got some in her, she would throw up and uh, no that again that's that's a brain that's not working right we need to know the truth is so important mental illness makes impossible the accurate understanding of what's going on and what to do about it it's a scourge, but we're working on it. That's why I say, the more we know, the safer we are. The more we can count on as the truth, the more wellness we have in our life. We're here to talk about wellness. That's why wellness and learning are inextricably bound together. The more I learn, the more I keep learning every day, learn something, I'm putting money in the bank of wellness for myself. Change your mind. Not because you want to throw away something that's true, because you want to add something. Or replace something with something that's true. You'll be better off. It's not necessarily the case that the truth will be pleasant. It's often the case that the truth is harmful, hurtful, painful. You're more well with that truth than you are by denying it. It's a lesson we should be teaching our kids and ourselves daily. Every day we learn something, we come of age. We're able to do things we couldn't do yesterday. Why re relegate that to the 20-year-old who may not be able to put his, know the difference between the brake and the gas pedal, but we let him drive a car? Or worse, hold a gun. Or worse, get married. When they're not ready, we should be measuring maturity, not chronological age. But we don't do that. It's too hard. You know why the drinking age is 19 in Ontario? Anyone know? It's not that hard to figure out. Something else happens at the age of 19. Well, it's really finishing high school, but that's the same answer, very good. That's, that's it. Most kids were 18 when they finished. 19 uh, is the year that they're not in high school anymore. Does that mean they're okay to drink? It's not, it's not. And by the way, I don't want to shock anyone, but those people under the age of 19 in Ontario actually occasionally consume alcohol. I don't know if you knew that. I don't want to shock anyone. Maturity. Whether it's neuro neurogenic maturity or learning in most cases. Okay, I didn't know that. Now I do. I changed my mind. I'm safer.
anxiety. Oh, no, I left something out. Beliefs. We're going to do it. an exercise, and I hope you will participate. Don't abstain, please. If you don't abstain, you won't learn something. Everything we do is based upon our belief system. I said that before. But most of our beliefs are beliefs that we don't know. We're not aware that we hold. Yet we do. So what's going on? So I'm going to demonstrate to you a belief that you didn't know you had. Think of a sunset. Imagine a sunset. Imagine a sunset on a calm sea, a flat horizon, with, if you care to do it, a circle approaching the horizon. Is there anyone who doesn't know what I'm talking about? Don't be shy. If you don't, I'll explain it. No, I know I'm not trying to be funny. I want to make sure everybody is there. All right, now imagine, this is a mind experiment, now imagine yourself reaching out and taking hold of that setting sun in your hand. If you can, forget that it's hot. It's just a circle now. Or maybe a sphere. What have you ever held in your hand that is the same size as the setting sun? Everybody can do this. So please, tell me what you think. Don't be shy. I, you, you won't be embarrassed. I, I would never embarrass you. Unless I had the opportunity. But no. No, I wouldn't do that. Anyone? Come on. It's not a hard question. It's not a trick question. There you go, a beach ball. What would you say? Orange. Oh, sorry? An orange. An orange, okay. Thank you, <laughs> Terry. Marble. A marble, okay. Do you at least, if you're shy to say out loud, do you at least have a mo something in your mind? That's important. You don't have to say it out loud. All right. Let's say I went to the bathroom. And I came back, and everybody's fighting. Everybody's yelling at each other. Everybody's hitting each other, calling each other names. It's terrible. There's, there's blows being thrown all around. What's going on? Well, she's an idiot. A beach ball. This is obviously an orange. An orange, you're both wrong. It's a marble. It's just, you're all disagreeing. I say, hold on. This is the stupidest argument I've ever seen. Why? Because the question of how big the setting sun is, it's not a theoretical, hypothetical question. It's what we call an empirical question. Next time you think there's going to be a sunset, get your beach ball, take your orange, get your marble, sit down, wait for the sun to come to the horizon, put your ball or your marble or whatever it is next to the sun, and you'll see if you're right or wrong. If you put a green pea less than half the diameter of a Canadian dime next to the setting sun, that would be the size. I just heard a sound in the room because I was listening for it. It was an explosive sound. It was a magnificent sound. You want to hear it? Huh. What a fantastic sound. The sound of a woman changing her mind. Realizing that all this time, though she never knew where it came from, she held a belief that turned out to be wrong. What are you going to do with it? Keep it? Hold on to it? Insist that you won the election? No. You learn. You change your mind. You'll never have to make that mistake again. You'll make many more, of course, like we all do every single day. But you're better today. You've come of age. Congratulations. That's what we have to do. Constantly challenge our beliefs. Not to believe that they're wrong, but to recognize that they might be wrong. 
If instead of asking you the size of a setting sun, I asked you what God wanted you to do on the face of the earth, and I went to pee, and I came back, and you're murdering each other, I'd say, that's precisely what's happening every single day on our world, killing each other, because we fail to see the same thing eye to eye with that other person over there. Because we can't accept that we might be wrong. It doesn't mean we are wrong, but to challenge ourselves, to look at ourselves, to question our beliefs, is to learn. And when we learn, by the way, the brain goes into action. The brain gives you a reward, just like Skinner's rats who press a little lever in a box somewhere and a pellet of food comes out and says, that's good, do that again. We have in our brain a reward system, reward mechanism that allows us to feel good. It doesn't allow us to feel good all the time, just when it's right to feel good. And when is it the most right to feel good? Just after you've done something that's good for your survival. Like eating feels good and like sex feels good. Learning feels good, too. Curiosity, the thing that drives us, the hunger for learning, drives us to do the thing that starts our brain reward mechanisms going. It's the thing I worked on in my scientific laboratory. I worked first with Peter Milner, the discoverer of brain reward mechanisms at McGill University, and then with some of his students. And in a way, I didn't like the chemistry that people were talking about. And I thought there's something other than dopamine at work. So I started looking around the brain. I found something, the locus ceruleus, a blue spot containing serotonin and I remember saying for the first time in the literature, serotonin's where we should be looking. And we have been for the last 40 years. When we do something that's good for us, we're rewarded. Go back and do that again. Keep learning. When you have a depressed person come to your office and they say, I'm depressed. You say, gee, I'm sorry to hear that. What's going on? Well, I just can't enjoy myself. I used to love music. And people put on music. They say, come on, cheer you up. We'll go hear a band. We'll put on a, put on a record on the record player, as Joe Biden said. Remember, he was talking about a record player. And everybody would say, what the hell is that? What's a record player? Nah, it doesn't. Uh, you go. Come on, the Leafs are in town, we're watching on the... No, you go. Nothing feels good anymore. If you read, as I know you have assiduously every day, the DSM-5, right? <laughs> what? No? Really? You don't? You should read it, it's quite a read. The sex scenes are particularly interesting. You have to get to chapter 15, that's... Some people get in chapter 11 first, they go bankrupt, and that's it. All right, that was a really bad joke. I, I didn't, I shouldn't have said that. That was horrible. That was horrible. Pretend you didn't see that. Loss, the, the cardinal definitions of criteria, loss of pleasure and interest. Pleasure can be restored biochemically. That's what antidepressants do. They allow you to feel good again, so that the reward for doing something that is good for you can be felt, and maybe you'll continue to do it again, and ascend from your dark place. But every prescriber of antidepressant medication knows very well that the pill is half the treatment. There must be counseling. There must be talking. There must be work to be done so that the antidepressant medication can do its work. 
must be. And very often it is not. Shamefully, but sadly, maybe, maybe not shamefully, that's too strong a word. So what is interest? Interest can't be restored biochemically. Interest, you gotta work on that. Interest is an interesting word. It begins with just an involvement in something. I'm interested in cooking, I'm interested in art, I'm interested in coming to the library. Maybe I'm interested in a certain form of law. Let's say my friend is a lawyer, went through law school with me and got to be a judge, and I say to her, listen, I'm so happy you got that case of political corruption or whatever it is, and that was always your thing, you must be thrilled. Say, oh yes, I'm very thrilled, I, you know, I'm very interested in it. She gets to the bench, she sees the defendant, she says, oh, everybody, I have to recuse myself, I have to step down, I can't hear this case. Why, Your Honor? Because I have an interest in it. Of course you do, that's why you got the job. And she says, no, 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 it's not that I'm uninterested. I'm not uninterested, I'm very interested. It's that I'm not disinterested. I know the defendant personally. I can't hear this case. I'm sorry, I would love to, but I can't. I have a vested interest in the case. The interest that requires an investment. If a person who's depressed has lost interest in themselves, they don't care about themselves. They don't have a vested interest. There's nothing in it for them to protect themselves. They'll go straight toward the toxin or the poison. They don't care what happens to them. That's not good. Can you, can you recover self-interest? Well, here's an exercise I hope you can do. Think of yourself as a straight line across your vision. Imagine it. And divide that line into three parts. Your relationships, your occupations, and your beliefs. Now, put dots on that line. Your relationships. You're a wife, you're a sister, you're a daughter, you're a friend, you're a coworker. The relationships you have with people that you know. Even the relationship with people you might not know, like great grandparents, you're still a relationship, but just stay with the people you know. And give yourself a mark for how good a son or a daughter or a friend or a coworker you are. Be honest. The truth can be painful. Be honest with yourself. Look at the truth. If you think you're the best friend, the best daughter, the best son, the best sister ever, you're probably wrong, but I'm not trying to be funny or anything. You're probably good, but maybe you are. Maybe you are. Give yourself the mark you feel honestly you deserve. Are you... Uh, are you an accountant? Okay, you're an accountant. Are you a good accountant or a bad accountant or a mediocre accountant? You're a plumber, you're a cook, you're a laundry person, you, you take care of the kids. Whatever you're doing, whatever you're occupied with is your occupation. You don't have to get paid for it. Yeah, you have to get paid for some of it, but you do so many things. Are you any good at them? How do you rate yourself? Now you're creating a graph and your beliefs. Maybe you're a Christian, maybe you're a Muslim, maybe you're a Jew. Are you a good Jew, a good Muslim? Only you know. Give yourself a mark. Maybe you're a liberal or a conservative or a new Democrat. Are you a good liberal? Are you a good new Democrat? Only you know. Maybe you're a philanthropist. Maybe you're a socialist. Maybe you're an atheist. Grade yourself. And then you'll see an image of yourself. How much emphasis to your value do you place on each of those points on the line of yourself? One example is a workaholic who says, I'm a great worker. I put in all, I get the highest marks for my job. I'm very successful, I'm very wealthy, I make lots of money for myself, for the company. Are you a good brother? 
Well, I don't get to see my brother. Are you a good husband? Well, I don't get to go home that much. Are you a good member of your community? Well, I'm not that involved in my community. What do we call a person who focuses on one aspect of their occupation? I'm not talking about, you know, naughty words. A workaholic. A person who, seeing the range of potential investments in himself, invest solely in one area. If he or she were to take $500,000 to an investment expert and say, I want to put this all on AT&T, or you were advised to put it all on AT&T and nowhere else, you'd run away from that person. That's a crappy way to invest your money. Very dangerous, not safe, diversify, spread it around. Do that with yourself. Diversify the investment in yourself. Make sure you're good at a lot of things. It's much safer, just like financially. And just like financially, if you invest in a money organization, what do you get back? We're talking about it. You go into a bank. You put down 50 bucks a week for five weeks. What do you get back at the end of five weeks? Right. It's not a mistake. It's not a coincidence. It's not that we ran out of letters and we had to think of something. Well, let's call it interest. I don't know. We've used that twice already. No, no, we can use it again. No, no, no. No, of course, that's the word. You get interest. The gift you get for making the investment. If you're investing in yourself, which you now have an honest assessment of, and investing in a diversified, balanced way, you develop self-interest. Not selfishness. You develop the need, the zeal, the vested concern to take care of yourself and not let something bad happen. That's the more powerful antidepressant. Anxiety. Anxiety means I don't know what's going to happen. I'm not sure what's going to happen. Maybe it's going to be something bad. Maybe the worst will happen. Oh my God, I don't know. What's the enemy of anxiety? Certainty. Truth. No, I know what's going to happen. The more I know, the safer I am. But if I give over my life to forces over which have, I have no control, I feel completely unsafe. That's where anxiety comes in. So many of my clients would come to me and say, Doc, I don't know. I, I had a good job. I need the job. I need the money. I have a family. I got fired. I say, that's too bad. What happened? He said, ah, this not the first time. Doc, why does this always happen to me? Said, well, that's a good question. Woman comes in and says, you know, I married a guy. I turned into the wrong guy. I found a guy. He was great. I married him. It turned out he was. I have two divorces. Now I'm with another guy. Why does this always happen to me? We got together for Thanksgiving. My son left. He you know, doesn't want to have anything to do with it. Why does this always happen to me? Why does this always happen to you? Let's say we weren't in a library but a kitchen. And let's say instead of a chair, this was a stove. And let's say that someone left the stove on, or I didn't realize, and I burned my hand on the stove. You, being nice people, would rush to my aid. Make sure, oh, poor guy, are you okay? Here, get some butter, get some ice, get some get some that, call an ambulance, whatever. You know, take care of me. Nice. Let's say we met tomorrow night in the very same room. And I went over to the very same stove and put the very same hand on the stove and burned it again. What would you think of me then? Let's say I did it a third night, a fourth night in a row, and I said to you in a pleading voice, why does this always happen to me? You would know for sure what you've been already thinking since I started talking. He really is an idiot. He really is an idiot. 
happen to you, you say, run. You're taking no, here it is, responsibility for your contribution. No, it's not my fault. That guy left the stove on. It's their fault. The, the library's to blame. I'm going to sue them. They should have put a sign there, danger, hot stoves. And did the library, should they have put a stove on? Maybe they should. Did the guy have turned off the stove? Maybe he should. Those are forces I can't control. When I can't control things, I'm anxious. I can control putting my hand on the stove. I'm the one who did it. Responsibility. The truth is my treatment of anxiety. Because now I'm in control. I can't stop the forces that would do me harm. But I can stop myself from doing me harm. And that makes me feel much, much safer. And finally, love and loneliness. So many times a relationship ends with someone saying, you've changed. What happened to that person I fell in love with? And now I'm lonely. And that's tough. I'm a good person. I'm loving. I'm intelligent. Pretty good in bed. I'm not trying to be funny. I, I, I should be with someone. I should have people around me, not just a romantic sexual partner. I should have family. I should have friends. Why am I alone so much? We mistakenly, far too often, confuse the word sex with the word intimacy. Sex is intimate, of course. But intimacy goes way, 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 and here's the word, deeper than sex. In fact, and indeed, the word intimacy comes from the Latin intima, or intimus, which means below or deep. The deepest layer of the skin is called the intima. Intimacy, the rest of intimacy is the rest of the iceberg. And it's the part we don't see, and it's the part we don't acknowledge, and it's the part we don't do so well at. So when a person meets another person, they go through an act that I've akin to the action of a pendulum. It's an Edgar Allan Poe pendulum that gets deeper as it swings. So does intimacy. Take the example of a stand-up comic. I love stand-up comics. You go to see them, and they're funny. That's why you go see them. You bring your friend, you say, oh, you will hear this first joke. This is a great joke. You're going to love this joke. And the guy tells a joke, or the woman tells a joke, and you laugh. And laugh. You heard it all yesterday. It's still funny. It's a funny joke. That's why you're laughing. It's always going to be funny. Your friend loves it. The comic starts the routine every time with that joke. Why? Because he or she knows he's going to get a laugh. What do we call that? The A material. That's the A material. That's going to get a laugh. I used to start my talks with the A material when I went to talk to a bunch of parents about raising their teenagers. And I said, look, we all want our kids to be independent and have their own lives. We want them to do things like we want our sons to drive a car when they're 46 years old. So they're not, you know, 16 or 10. And we want our daughters to have a wonderful, vibrant sex life after we're dead. <laughs> Always got a good joke. That was A material. It was a great way to start, except in the religious school north of Hamilton, where... Uh, okay, where am I now? I'm in a religious school in Hamilton. They didn't think that was so funny. But the comic, a material, always. Always. But here's the problem. You can't tell the A joke forever. Because times change. Oh, guess what President Kennedy did today? 
Kennedy, what, what, where are you? Where have you been for the last 60 years? Yeah, you got to bring it, bring it up. So A jokes, eventually they did their thing. It was great. Now we have to bring up a B joke. B jokes aren't as guaranteed to be funny. They're still pretty funny, but they need a little work. They may become A material. Then there's the C, D, E, and F jokes. That's how they work. A man meets a woman at a party, doesn't see a wedding ring. He doesn't have one. She's very attractive. He goes over to her. She doesn't seem to mind. He has to start with something. He can't just go over to her and say, okay, well, well, you, you know, if you're interested, you, you have to say something. What does he start with? The A material. It's guaranteed. Everyone's got A material. I never went over to some course. I've been married 50 years now. I had my 50th anniversary this year. 46 different women. But... <laughs> 50, no, one woman. And it's not we're actually together 54 years. If I go over to someone and I say, I'm a psychologist, a brain researcher, say, oh, one of those, forget it. I don't want to see you. Get out of my life. No, it's good. It's attractive. Here's the way this pendulum works. Now I've said something that's true about myself. It's guaranteed to be okay. I look around the room, I see a lot of skin on people. You're not embarrassed to show me that part of your skin. You shouldn't be. More skin? Ugh. This is as much as you're willing to show. For skin, that's your A material. It's okay. I'm not going to reject you. But let's say I finish with my A material and I say to her, can I tell you my A joke again? She's going to say, no, I heard your A joke. You're going to have to start going a little deeper. But if you tell her what you do, she'll tell you what she does. But the pendulum drops. You have to get deeper. All right, I got to tell you that I'm divorced. Well, she might leave you and say, I don't want to have anything to do with divorced people. Or she might say, look, it happens in the world. It's not a big deal. Maybe she's divorced too. It goes back. If you want to know if someone is divorced, if you want to know if someone has, God forbid, cancer in their family or mental illness in their family, show them yours. I showed you mine. You'll show me yours. Why? Because I trust you. I trust you with this information. You're not going to hurt me. Well going down to C material. The reason I got divorced, I'm an alcoholic. Oh, an alcoholic. But I haven't had a drink in four years. Here's my medal. I go to course. I haven't had a drink. She might say, well, you know, you're a nice guy. It can happen. And my, my cousin is an alcoholic. She'll show you hers. And it continues on trust. But it's slowly Slowly. You don't go right down to yanking off all your clothes and jumping into bed. Yet. Because when the brain sees you doing that, the brain says, well, I must trust them, but they don't call in the morning. Take it easy. Take it slow. Let's make all the stops along the way. They don't teach that in sex education. It's a tragedy that they don't. They leave out the most important part in sex education. I said to people, oh, you took sex education? What did you learn about? Well, I learned about the anatomy. Did you know anything about the anatomy? No, I knew everything. So what did you learn? Nothing. No learning, no wellness. Sorry, no coming of age. Well, we learned about condoms. Oh, yeah, condoms are good. Did you think you would use one? Yeah. Did you think you would use one before you had the class? Yeah, so you didn't learn anything. Did they teach you about intimacy? The thing that's missing in all the relationships that end up on the rocks? No. No, no, we don't teach that. You should. If you think the kids can't take it, you're wrong. 
I taught that to kids for 30 years outside of the curriculum, all over the world. They want to hear about that. As you get down into the deeper areas, you have to start exposing parts of yourself, whether it's sexual or not, that are private and delicate and personal and not shared with everybody except that special person you trust not to hurt you. Remember those beds in Istanbul? I started my talk about sex by grabbing a bottle, an empty vodka bottle. There were many of them. I couldn't drink because I was talking till dawn. I went through the rows like Phil Donahue, only instead of a microphone, I had a bottle. And I said to a fellow, would you put your hand over here on this sheet? And he put his hand there, and I said, thank you very much. He went to this woman over here, put your hand on the sheet. No. She put her hand on the sheet. Thank you very much. Went off. I knew it wouldn't take long before someone would say, no, I'm not going to do it. He said, really? You're not going to put your hand on the sheet where I can see it? No. Well, why not? Well, I don't know. I don't know. I said, can I make a suggestion? The last time you put your hand out on the sheet in an Istanbul nightclub, a crazed, balding, aging Jewish-Canadian psychologist hit you with a vodka bottle. That's the only reason we won't show the other person that part of ourself. We're afraid he will leave us or she will leave us. It's too bad to be good. But if you transpose that situation to a sexual situation where one person is taking off his shirt and the other is taking off their shirt and undershirt and underwear and everything, then another person stops and he's got his pants on. And she says, are we doing this or not? He says, absolutely we are. And she says, well, I don't think so, because you're still covering up private parts. And I can tell because I'm looking right at it. And anyone here who thinks that a human doesn't know when the other person is covering their private parts emotionally, you're wrong. It's very obvious. And they say, if you won't expose yourself, we can't have sex. If you won't expose yourself emotionally, we won't have a relationship that is valid. So here's the thing with intimacy. The only other word in English that I know that derives from intimacy is intimidating. Because intimacy is intimidating. It's scary. You could get hurt. But if you don't expose yourself, it's over. If you do expose yourself, it might continue or it might be over. Those are your only two choices. The truth is always important to survival. And the way we get to the truth is through learning. Learning more makes us safe. And safety, my friends, is wellness. That's what I wanted to talk to you about tonight. It's not as early as I hoped it would be, but I think we have until 8.30, which leaves us plenty of time for questions, if there are any, or discussion. The only thing I may have to do is repeat the question so that it goes into the recording, but I don't mind doing that. So are there any questions or discussion or comments? Did you hate what I said? Did you love what I said? Did you not listen to what I said? I told you there would be. Was any was anything was anything contrary? Was anything offensive? I, I'm I'm not saying this because I want you to stroke me with love, uh, but I, I I really believe in this stuff. It took 40 years to develop these exercises and these thoughts, but it's not going to be 
right for everybody. Did you learn something about the brain? Did you learn something about mental illness? Did you learn something about how learning is changing your mind? That's all it is. So that you now know more and are safer. Well, you're welcome, Terry. Um, I, I wanted to give you things that you haven't heard before, so you could learn. I'm, I'm, oh, oh, I do have to repeat what Terry said. The, it wasn't really a question, it was just a comment that this fellow is very intimate. This fellow, for those of you who are, pick, couldn't pick that up, just gave me a very nice compliment that I had said things that he hadn't heard before and that I had put it in a way that was simple without being simplistic, without being patronizing. Uh, the, you know, I've always said that if you can't explain complicated things in simple language, you probably don't understand it well enough. Some of you may know who know me as an artist, know that I had a a project several years ago that was a tribute to the American Nobel uh, author John Steinbeck. And Steinbeck uh, is kind of my hero. And I'm actually thinking of reprising that. I've had offers to reprise it in Pennsylvania and Washington State, which would be kind of cool. But one thing he said was he called them the little men of science. And he said, the littlest men of science wear the biggest robes and the hats and they use big words and they confuse you with big words. You don't have to do that. This was in a monograph called America on Americans, written in 1966. And what he was doing was he was making fun of people who use big words to confound the listener into believing that they're smart. You can, you can say it in simple words. It's not as easy. But thank you for the comment, Terry. I appreciate that. Sandy. It's true. We've, we've known each other for many years now, Sandy. So again, thank you. Not really a question, but a comment. And for those of you who don't know Sandy, she's a grief counselor, I guess would be the way to say it. I don't know. A bereavement counselor? Forgive me. Uh, maybe I'm not getting it right, but smart lady over here. And, uh, and she, she already knew that because I told her it seven years ago. But no, she probably knew a lot of it on her own. She didn't need me to tell her. Cindy? As I said earlier, this was a opening presentation in a series on coming of age, the wellness of learning. Did I get that right? Yeah. Um, and a really interesting comments and really interesting concepts and things that got us all thinking. But can you try to tie it back to the next couple presentations and just the overall, as the Learn and Live program evolves, just the overall concept of what we hope to do in the learn and live in terms of coming of age. You're, you're always coming of age every day, and it's never too old. It's a cliche, but it's never too old to learn a new thing. No. So maybe just put that in there. A little bit of this is the then that you're going to wish you knew then. Right. Uh, only it's now. Um, but would it be putting you on the spot, Larry, if I asked you to, since you're giving the next one? Uh, I, I, I can only say, Cindy, that the, the term learn and live, as you know, and Larry knows because we were on the Zoom meeting together, used to be live and learn. And that's a more common phrase. But learn and live is more what I'm saying about it. In other words, 
it's not just a phrase, it's an instruction. Learn so that you will live. The more you learn, the easier it will be to get through life. And that's why learning engenders living. But would it be okay, Larry, did you want to, it'd probably be way better for you to talk about what you're going to say. And don't worry if it doesn't tie in exactly, you know, dovetail with what I've said. Well, learning to live uh, has always uh, resonated with me. Uh, my talk came out of uh, four years of work uh, with the Alzheimer's Society of Canada as their scientific advisor. And um, I discovered at the end of the four years that there are a lot of confused people about what dementia was and what aging is. And um, I started to talk to a couple of colleagues and we put together a book and we're trying to uh, demystify what dementia is. And and that's what the talk's about. And that's wonderful. Thank you. And and that's what I'm what I'm saying. Even if it's something scary like dementia, and, and there are lots of scary things out there, the more you know about it, the easier it is to face. Uh, I I often for some of my clients they have. Uh, there's one fellow I'm seeing now for about seven years. Came to me many years ago. He very lovely guy. He's bright. He's talented. He didn't want to have rely on his parents to put him through school, so he took four years off to get enough money to go to graduate school in Ottawa to become a diplomat, which he now is, and uh, a lovely guy. But he was working at the LCBO to make that money because it had good hours and reasonably good pay. And but his boss was driving him nuts. And he he didn't he didn't want to give up the job. He liked the job. It was you know for him easy to do and good money and just down the street from where he lived. Paid for himself for everything. A really swell guy. And but his boss, I said, describe your boss to me. Turned out that the boss was probably somewhere in the moderate range to maybe even a little on the higher range of obsessive compulsive disorder, which is a very difficult thing to live with. Especially a place like the LCBO, where all the labels have to be exactly in this, and they usually are. It's not that they aren't, but you know, God forbid, it's a millimeter off. The boss would go into a rage and this and that. It was tough, tough to live with. I said, read up on OCD to my guy. Learn about it. This guy's behavior now is going to become clinical to you. You don't have to take it personally. You can even predict, I bet he's going to do this, and you kind of even smile and give yourself a little laugh when he does it because. The more you know, the safer you are. So the more you know about dementia, really the safer you are. I'm sure you'd agree, Larry. You and I have never had a chance to sit down and talk. I hope we will very soon. But, but I'm sure you would agree with that. Even if it's tough news, it's better than not knowing. Uncertainty is, 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 dis, is dispatched by learning. Well, we wrote the book also about how you might deal with it as an individual, um, both yourself by being with your friends and how they can help, by um, help the kind of help you can get in the community, and finally, what kinds of things the health service might do. And uh, we weren't aware of any book that took that approach. Like, there's a lot of documentation about what it might be and what the causes might be. But um, we wanted to emphasize. Terrific. I, I could, I, you couldn't ask for more, really. And uh, thank you for writing that book. Uh, so that will be the book. Are there any other questions or comments, Chris Fletcher? Or? I have another, but I'm not sure. Uh, oh, it opens up a whole different world. An added world. The role of values. Values. Yes. How they play, how they can anchor or disanchor, um, as a foundation. I don't know, there's something there. 
Oh, uh, would you like? A I mean, that's if you don't know Terry, <laughs> you know you're going to get a good question from this man. Uh, I had a chance to speak to a national audience on American television in 2014. It was the last time I had such a chance, and I don't need that again. And it was about families and family values. And they said, what's happening to the American family? It was out of Chicago. And I, I happened to be in town for some lectures. And I said, well, you've forgotten your basic value, your basic principle as a country is democracy. You say it all the time. You use it all the time. You spread it around the world, sometimes violently all the time, thinking it's the very best way to govern. But I'll bet you you couldn't tap anyone on the shoulder on the street out on uh, Michigan Avenue who can give you a good definition of democracy. You've lost that value. Here is the, the, the essence of democracy is that it allows for, in fact, demands a respectful and constructive opposition to the person or party in power without fear of death, uh, abandonment, jail, isolation, murder of the family, we not only allow respectful and constructive opposition, we insist upon it. Some of you are old enough, probably all of us are, to remember what Frank McKenna did in the late 80s. Do you remember that, Betty? When all of the New Brunswick legislature, I think it was 18, I'm probably wrong about that, were liberals in the provincial election. You remember that? I do too. They couldn't go forward. The Constitution said you must have an opposition. They had no opposition. They didn't know what to do. What are you going to call another election? You have the same result. It's, they went to scholars. And what McKenna did, I thought it was a stroke of genius, was he assigned his own members to act as the critic. You'll be the health minister. You'll be the health minister. I know you're a liberal, but you have to speak for everybody who would oppose our government at the highest level and not be worried about being shot or something like that. That value, basic, you don't get more basic than that, of democracy in a society has been eroded in the United States of America and other places too. And if we're not afraid of that, I don't know what would frighten us. We have disrespect. We've lost civility. We see outrageous acts, criminal acts, that go not even noticed, let alone punished. And the values that we hold for each other, the respect that we hold for each other. You know, I'm, this is not going to be a, a political statement. Don't worry about that. I, I know that's not right for here. But for six years in Niagara on the Lake, I wanted to and worked hard on, as you know, Terry, to develop an art gallery in Niagara on the Lake. It turned out it wasn't the thing that people wanted. That's okay. I, you know, I was disappointed. But here's the thing that the hallmark of that, the motto was seeing eye to eye. So that you could look at something the other person is looking at, see it entirely differently, see something entirely different looking at the very same thing from a different angle and not beat each other to death over the disagreement, to listen, to hear, to respect. You don't have that anymore. I sat on a boat with Lita across us on the boat it was a Republican couple from Pennsylvania, the nicest people in the world. They knew we didn't agree with them. We knew they didn't agree with us. We had a wonderful conversation. It lasted hours for differences in economic approaches and intellectual approaches. I said, I know what you're, you want. I'm not calling you crazy for wanting that. I just don't think that's the way to go. You know what I want. If we respect each other, that value. I'm not sure that's where you're going with that commentary, 
But when we talk about values deteriorating, I think the, the, the value of respect and civility and, and, and giving, well, I'm repeating, giving respect to someone else, giving respect to, well, yeah, exactly. So I, I don't know if that got anywhere near addressing, in the ballpark is good enough for me. We'll have a couple of cups of coffee somewhere, fill out the rest of it. Oh, yes. But is there, what is the issue when, and not really answering no, it's, all right. don't worry. <laughs> we all have masks on. I don't even know who the heck you are. <laughs> who is this lady? Right, right. Um, so anyway, um, what is the issue then when someone cannot find intimacy with anyone? Or they can't find intimacy with that other person? Ah, well, it, that's easier. <laughs> that the, the, They don't want to is, I'm not saying it's good, it's not good at all, but that's easier because they don't want to. But if they want to and they can't find, so what I would suggest in those cases is let go of the intimacy thing for a while. That's not happening for you right now, but don't throw it away. Just put it over there. You, you know where to find it. Now, do those other things I was talking about. Look at yourself. Get a good sense of who you are. Develop interest in yourself. Develop self-respect. Develop self-esteem. Uh, self-interest. Care about yourself. And adjust the areas that you think are missing. Because maybe you say, look, I'm a, I'm a great brother but I'm, I'm to, to my brother, but I'm not a great brother to my sister, let's say. So you can do something about it. You put a deposit in there. You put a couple of bucks in that. And I'm going to call my sister. Improving the areas where you need or you know you maybe aren't the greatest whatever friend or whatever it might be, member of whatever it is. I don't want to get you know, personal. Invest in that area. You'll see. You'll, you'll feel more balanced. You'll feel more well. You'll be able to be more comfortable exposing, and you'll have better parts to expose to people. So you're not afraid. Usually it's afraid, the fear of being unacceptable. You won't like me because I'm divorced, or I once hit my child, but I'm okay now. And I realize those are serious things, but I'm working on it. So for the time being, work on yourself. So for example, I always say to men, usually, that I'm seeing, I, I just said this recently to a client. He has this woman he really likes, and he's, but he's a little shy to ask her out. He says, I would, but what if she doesn't want to go with me? I don't know. I don't want to be rejected. And I said, I have an idea for you. And by the way, I've used this. I've used it, not me personally, but I've given this to many, many men and some women over the time. I said, go to her and say, would you go out with me twice? And she'll say, did I hear you correctly? I say, yes, I'm asking you on two dates. She says, two dates? No one's ever asked me out on two dates for the first date before. Why are you doing that? You tell her, because you ever cook pancakes? Yeah? The first one never turns That's right. <laughs> the first one you throw away. Every time you say that to her, she's charmed. Oh, I'm going to say stupid things. You're going to say stupid things. I'm going to be so nervous. You're going to be nervous. I'm not going to do anything. We can throw that pancake out. Let's go on two dates. We'll be more who we are. I'll be able to be who I am. You'll be able to be more who you are. It may turn out that we're not right for each other, Betty. But at least it'll be a more honest decision. And we won't have to go away crushed. 
And I tell you, I'm not kidding. I, I guess it sounds like I'm bragging. 100% batting average. It worked, the guy says. I can't believe it. I went over. I, I, I'm so embarrassed to say it worked. She, she said no one's ever done it because it's, you're, you're, you're making yourself safer by doing that. There's more wellness involved in that. And you're being honest. She's going to say, yeah, I was worried. I might screw up. Let's say I do something. So that's, that's another way. Or get involved in an activity that you want to improve without the, the thought of meeting someone. Don't go on dating sites and this and that because it's too dangerous. So take a cooking class. Uh, you learn how to cook. It's always better. I always tell guys to learn how to cook. And I always say, I remember saying this to a fellow back in Chicago. I said, invite her to your home and cook her a meal. You cooking her, you know, hot dogs and beans and putting it on a paper plate is way better than going to an expensive restaurant and paying a fortune on her. Why? Because you did it for her. This is from you to her. You made the effort. You didn't pay someone. And that's, so learn, but then learn how to do something other than hot dogs and beans. Learn how to do something better and better and better. And whether you meet someone doing it, because there's going to be other people who at least you know you have something in common. You both like cooking. It's a start. And then there's other things that you can know. So for example, people who are successful uh, in, in meeting someone are usually people who have good relationships with their birth family or their, their family that raised them. If you say, uh, oh, I love my mom. She's always around. <laughs> If you're, a, if you're a man and you tell a woman that you love your mom, there's a good chance you're going to love her. You have respect for women. You have, it says a world of things without saying it out loud. She knows he loves his mom. He's going to love me. I'm going to love his mom. And I'm not going to have to fight his mom every Thanksgiving or something like that. Instead, it'll be easy. So there are a, a myriad of these kinds of back and forths that make you safe, so you don't have to get to the heavy stuff. But we all have heavy stuff. Let's face it, we, we just were human. Uh, we don't like to finish by saying, uh, did you have something? No, well, I would like to, but continue. Oh, okay. That's how I'm saying. We, we don't like to describe ourselves as great apes, but aliens coming to Earth looking at us would recognize us right away. We're, we're not, we don't have dominion over everything else. We are part of everything else. We're a species. We're flawed. We're ape-like. Most of our behavior would look like an ape to anyone who's never seen the world before. So let's just accept that. We're flawed beings. We make mistakes. We're not perfect. But we can still love each other. I, I think that's our only hope, really. It's very worrisome, no doubt about it. Uh, I remember talking to some of us uh, about this, about activism. And it was a woman, a, a lovely lady, and I said, we have to become more active. We have to become more in, involved. We, our generation, I think I'm a, a little beyond you in, in generations, but nevertheless, the adults... <laughs> the, 
let's not go there. <laughs> uh, all I'm saying is, uh, I said to this woman, we have to become more active. We have to be activists again. Do you remember us? I remember saying this to her. She said, what do you mean? I said, us. Do you remember us? And what I meant was, we were the shit disturbers, weren't we? We said, hell no, we won't go. We sat down, we got up, we marched over there, we educated people, we made sure the world went the right way, whether it was right or wrong was for history to decide. But it was right then, and I think it's still right now, by the way, why aren't we continuing? What happened to us? Did we get so soft? Did we, did we get so lazy or tired? Let's get involved. We're all here tonight instead of watching a soap opera or something on TV. We can do that. We can make noise again. And, and that's, what we can, that's what I meant by taking responsibility for the situation we're in. Instead of saying, that's what's happening out there. What are we going to do about it? And gives us anxiety. That's not post hoc responsibility. Now I'm talking about ad hoc responsibility. It, it hasn't happened yet, but we can prevent it from happening by doing the responsible thing, which in my mind is educating our young people. Let's do it. No, we said we'd stop at 8.30. Uh, but that's a perfect segue of a call to action. Let's keep our mind active. Let's continue to learn. From, let's help me out with the words here, Rob. Let's, uh, no, you're, you're saying it perfectly. Um, so, I won't, I won't try to repeat the last two hours. Of, this has been terrific. Now, beyond mm -hmm. my wildest expectations of how great this whole series could be kicked off. I think it was just terrific. Thank, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So, as I said earlier, you're all registered for all three sessions. Um, November 9, Larry is going to talk to us about reducing the risk of dementia strategies. Dementia may not be the big, easy, scary word, um, how to recognize it, how not to recognize it. And then in December, we'll talk about the acute death. Um, so fill out your evaluations. Um, leave them at the front with Terry or myself. Um, or take it with you and get it back. I should have put an email address on the bottom of that, and I didn't. Um, but maybe get it back to the library. Yeah, and uh, and um, think about any future topics you would like to speak to the sessions in the coming group next year. I'm not sure exactly where to put this. Excuse me. Okay. Oh. oh, you're welcome. Thank you. And not to listen to music, but maybe get people to come and give us just a few minutes of jazz and blues and pop and all of those things. So those are just a couple of my ideas that I'm thinking. But I'd love to hear from all of you.